Hello everyone. <coughs> Perdón. Hello everyone. I'm Nuria Cubas, member of the Official Competition Selection Committee, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the 15th edition of Punto de Vista. We are a meeting with the filmmakers whose films are part of the program three of the official competition. So I would like to welcome Pablo Marín, director of Trampa de Luz, Santiago Bonilla, director of Paralelo 28, Sasha Libinseva, director of Every Rupture, and Felix Blume, director of Luces del Desierto. Hello and thank you for participating in this conversation. Um, the films that make up this program have in common the search for an, uh, the search for and above all the finding of new forms for images. In this sense, I would like to begin as by asking Pablo Marin, who is not only one of the great creators of atmospheres in contemporary exper experimental cinema, but also a tireless craftsman, uh, always researching new analog effects for his films. Uh, Pablo, I'd like you to tell us where your images begin. If it's in the filters and exterior gadgets you apply to your lenses, or if it's directly in the image that is uh, formed inside the camera. I mean, um, in a way, I'd like you to tell us how that craftsmanship works and how much control or surprise there is in the way you work. Well, thank you. Uh, and, and thank you, Nuria, for, for that introduction um, and thank you for all the words about my 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 film um, yes this this is I, I think I feel in a way like a, a, a strange or, or an outsider in, in in a documentary film festival mainly because of, of that maybe that quality or that interest that uh, always is behind every film I make in in, in, in the sense of, of uh, in a way, not, not trying to just capture reality, but trying to to force reality in a way by by ways of creating very simple because there there are these gadgets are very primitive in a way. But but the, my my main idea behind the, these films is to try to complement the the, the 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 force of nature with the force of a film camera in, in, in this sense, in analog cinema in, in, in my case, right? So in, in, in that sense, uh, it's a very intuitive uh, relationship. When, when I'm making a film, there's a, a preconcept or, or a, a notion of what I want to, to do in terms of a, or, or what kind of image I want to create, but in 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 reality when i go to to the place i, I want to to shoot uh, i always end up like uh, making a sort of of or negotiating with with the with the with the nature in 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 a way it's it's a very funny i know it's a very funny concept but but in in terms of of what i i want to make and what the the nature dictates i'm always trying to to establish a sort of balance between uh, making a film or making an image that it's too controlling of that nature and, and all, also as well trying to capture the, what nature is, is trying to do or, or what, what aspects of that nature, of that forest, of that water, it's, it's, it's relevant to me. So it's, it's a very intuitive and very subjective uh, idea of shooting i think i i i, I don't have a pre precise answer in terms of uh, i go with a plan and then i i just execute that plan but in in, in reality it's sort of like a balance I, I i plan some things but then when i'm shooting that plans always gets thrown away in a way Well, Pablo, in addition to being a filmmaker, you are a programmer, writer, translator, etc. And you are a great expert in Argentinian experimental cinema. It would be nice if you could tell us where you place your work within the tradition of Argentine experimental cinema and who have been your greatest influences. 
Um, well, I, I don't I don't know that much about being an expert, but uh, I, I I do tend to to cross that line that divides uh, making a film and also showing films or or writing about films or or trying to to promote some films. So in in that sense, I I, I my my filmmaking is just one tiny uh, part of of a general interest in film, right? So in in that sense. My interest in in Argentine experimental cinema it it, it was it it uh, in a way it comes from from this fascination with with trying to make a new kind of image or or trying to 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 push the boundaries in a way to see what film can also be uh, uh, in in parallel to to what film it's or, or, or the notion or the idea of film that it's of filmmaking that it's traditionally teach in 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 most of parts of the world. So in that sense, uh, my my relation to 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 the historical experimental film uh, made in Argentina, I think it, it has to be with this idea of trying to push the technology or try, trying to to work with with a really primitive and really simple uh, cameras and machines. Most of my films are made on, on Super 8, so so I'm also trying to 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 squeeze all all that can be be taken out from Super 8, which is a really small format, as 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 you might know. And and in a sense, my 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 relationship with with the traditional experimental film from from this country has to deal in 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 most of the time with this trying to rethink uh, what can be done with a Super 8 camera, what can be done with, with the idea of a, a technology that was designed to be really amateurish and very and very homemade in a way, and trying to push it to a very, in, 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 in the better cases, to a, to a poetic instrument in that sense. So the, the, the masters or the influences are many, are Narcisa Hirsch, Claudio Caldini, Jorge Honig, are, are, and also contemporary and and, and 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 people that are trying to 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 do the same thing with film in Buenos Aires or in Argentina right now, as Paolo Mazzolo, Azucena Luzana, uh, Benjamin Ellenberger. Uh, there's a community that that trying to and, and that I feel part of, and they are also trying to to push this idea of what can be done with 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 a camera, right? Well, the, um, the synopsis of your film is a quote from the poem Graveyard by the Sea by Paul Valéry, uh, which says, I'm going to read it in the Spanish version because I don't have the English one, maybe you have it. It says, um, Cerrado y sagrado, lleno de un fuego sin materia, un fragmento de mundo ofrecido a la luz. Um, was this poem the starting point of uh, for Trampa de Luz? Uh, no, no. Actually, it, it's. I think it's. It's kind of funny how, or, or curious in a way, how when you, when I start making a film, and then this film took like two years in total to make because I, I, I shot some roles and then I, I processed them and then I watched them over and over again and I felt that there was nothing there, and then the next year I, I shot another role and and then all started to like talk to each other in a way, and I think that. When, when I was just like finishing the, the, the final editing of the film, uh, it's common, I feel that it's common in, in, in my kind of, of, of process that many things that apparently has nothing to do with their start or like circling around and they are all like being pushed into this sort of black hole which everything makes sense to each other in a way. And and in that sense, I, I was I was reading Paul Valéry, and, and I and, and I saw this quote that, for me, it's it's a sort of des definition of what cinema is, right? I mean, a very poetic, of course, definition. Uh, I have like the last sentence of the poem in English here, and, and it says, "Earthly fragment to the light exposed," and I think that's that's a definition of cinema itself, right? And and in that sense, it was like the, the final piece. Or the final element that 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 
fell into the the phase of the final phase of editing the film, right? It, it's I, I I consider this film to be a a, a sort of this kind of uh, I don't know what's the term in English, but this like mirror balls with this the snowflakes on it, like the the one in mm -hmm. Citizen Kane, uh, a sort of like creating this tiny miniature world uh, that it's kept inside and it's like a, a, a very precise thing and it's a closed circuit in a way and and the the poem by paul valery it, it struck me as a very cohesive like definition of, of of that right like this this tiny thing that that it's offered to the world and it's made of light and and it's also a portion of the real world so so uh, the idea of, of presenting my film through paul valery's words has to do with with this also this notion of okay this is not reality and this is a a, a very filter and very uh, subjective view of, of that world that is out there mm. well returning to the idea of the um, of the search for new forms of representation in parallelo 28 we find a type of image that refers to the creative documentary, but that breaks away, distorting the image in rays of color or light, um, or blurring it in selected fragments, generating a space in continuous contradiction between reality and this other place, which we could, um, which could be the other side of the mirror. Santiago, uh, can you tell us a little about this decision? I think I was trying to think in in the objects and how to represent them. No, I was trying to to think. Yeah, the difference between an image and an object. No, how and how how can we film them? No, and for me, like raw material was the key point. No, like I knew if there is still an object that we can for sure know that it's true is raw material no because it's linked with everything no with, with i mean not only not only uh, i mean with the real world but also like in my case i was related relating it with uh, work no so my idea basically was that raw material and work still is the proof that the world exists and uh, but at the same knew that I was making an image of these objects and these uh, places and these landscapes, and, and and I knew I was lying in a way, no, like this is an old discussion, no, but uh, that I I knew that I wasn't uh, that I was re representing no reality. So uh, I think I. I, I asked myself the same questions that uh, the, the painting uh, did many years ago, no, in the 20th century or even before, no. Um, and, and, and yeah, those questions are how, yeah, an image can an object and how it's related with life and how something three something dimensional, dimensional. You know? And, and that was more or less my 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 guideline for shooting and for the project. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the film has a series of uh, cryptic elements that are very much in harmony with <clears throat> with this kind of image: the sand, the the dog and even we can see death or ghosts. Um, clearly in the film there is no interest in bringing order to all these elements, but I would like you to tell us how they came about. I think more or less the same, like I think I was wondering what an object is and what a body is to you know, like maybe now, maybe it became more abstract at the end, you no, know, with the movie. But yeah, I was wondering what a body is and 
and how can I represent it you know, with an image, with a bi-dimensional image. Um, and that's why the whale is there, you know, like I think for me the whale is the only true object in the movie, you know, not only because it's, not only because it's dead, but also because it's, like it's there, you know, like you can see that it, the weight and the, and, and, and how is it still struggling, you know, with sea and with waves. Um, I think that was the, the, yeah, how I made the decisions for the movie, you know, and, and, it, and then the ghost came naturally, you know, because, you no, know, I, re I remembered a lot the title of this Gilberto Perez book, you no, know, uh, the, 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 that is about cinema, you no, know, the material ghost, you no, know, and I was, I mean, I didn't look for it, but it came very easily, you know. And when I found this story about the dog, you know, with the workers, you know, that it didn't, it, it wasn't my idea, you know, it was their idea. And then, I don't know, like everything for me made sense, you know, and at this moment, like, yeah, because uh, I think it talks again about materiality and, and, and objects in images and something that is not there and but it is you no know, like the absence is present you know and, and, and yeah more or less i don't know if i answered but uh, more or less mm -hmm. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about the title parallelo 28 well, Parallelo 28 is the, the parallel where this salt mine, which is the biggest in the world, I think the biggest in China, but it's, it's scattered you know, in all the country. But this one in Mexico is the only one where, uh, you know, like it's uh, together, it's the biggest one. No? And it's basically in that, in the parallel of the earth, no? in the great parallel of the earth. Um, and for me, I don't know, like I, I shot this project for for Le Frenois, which is a school in France, and, uh, and and I was trying to talk at the beginning about uh, uh, traveling or how can I say this? Uh, like salt always salt is cheap, but but what it costs what what is expensive is to move it. Uh, so basically, this salt mine, they all the all the technology and all the machines, what they do is uh, uh, move the salt, no, no, in the territory, and they go to to Japan, no. But Japan is like the half of the salt mine uh, belongs to Japan. Uh, so basically, what they do is, uh, yeah, salt is traveling, no, salt is. How, how can you move the salt? That's the 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 work for my no, and for these workers. So I was uh, I was wondering how. Yeah, I was asking myself about the place and the locality and the and the specific coordinates of 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 uh, of raw material, no, in this way, and I was trying to relate it with. Of course, Mexico and in, 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 in the production of uh, raw material no? and how we export raw material because it's what we have. And then other countries, like, uh, how do you say this in English? Like, uh, hacen plus valor, no? Como que generan plus valor de, de, de la materia. They make uh, surplus, no? It's the word in English, I, I think. And um, and yeah, I don't know. Like I was trying to think in all this, and for me, like to, to precise or to yeah yeah to say the precise location of this salt mine for me was important. To, you know, to it's not an abstract mine, but it's this mine. Mm -hmm. well, um, 
if uh, Paralelo 28 has a mysterious uh, atmosphere, it also has uh, Luces del Desierto, that is a nocturnal and very mysterious film. Um, Felix, uh, you described your previous film, Curupira, Criatura del Bosque, which is also about a legendary and enigmatic character as a sound thriller in the middle of the jungle. Now you describe uh, Luces del Desierto as a sound horror film in the darkness of the, of the desert. Um, what is your relationship with genres? Well, uh, actually, I'm just uh, playing with. Uh, actually, I don't have such a relation with generous in general. And uh, actually, when if I'm playing a bit with the generous, it's because even maybe with the idea of a film, I'm a bit playing. Uh, both films are maybe not really films. Maybe it's more like a sound piece with images. That's how I concept them, and how I do them. Actually, uh, mostly for Kurupira, for example, I was really doing a sound piece and at some point i had to put subtitles and then i had a lot of black images and then i had to put something in between and then it became more a film than a sound piece so in a way i like to to lie or to to uh, to say something and then audience or public will uh, watch something different uh so yeah i just i like to play with with game and category i think it's uh, in any way very complicated to to make category of uh, this of generous of of what is a film or, or as pablo marino was saying uh, what is a documentary film or not so um, uh, yeah i find it interesting just to, to to try to i don't know exactly the word but to to give false uh, indication to the to the audience and to see what what happens. Um, your film is uh, made up of nocturnal images and testimonies, um, and as there are many voices that are mixed all together, the testimony that is formed at the end is uh, at the same time unitary and collective. How did you work with this? I mean, how, how did you work with each of the people who gave voice to the film and how did you work with uh, on the final testimony? Yeah, actually, I, I like the idea that uh, a lot of personal testimony can uh, make a general testimony or as how many, a lot of small stories can make the story of a place or, or, or of a culture of something. So uh, that's how I've been working in my previous film, in a way, and this time I've done the same, uh, the same, like, like trying to to record small testimony to make some small uh, chats with the people or to make some interviews with the people uh, in in this place. In this place, uh, it's a specific place which is a desert of San Luis Potosi. It's in Mexico. And uh, all I've been working is basically, uh, I went to this place, uh, we were two, uh, we were just uh, arriving to this place and uh, we arrived with our microphones and that's my fair way of presenting me, it's just like, I'm here, I'm a sound recorder and I'm here to record the sound of the desert. And um, even if I start from, from the nature, uh, a bit as Pablo Marin told too about this nature, but I'm including in the nature all the inhabitants and uh, all the people living and traveling and um, being there in this place. And uh, actually the idea to come with some microphones and people start asking, but why are you recording micro uh, sounds or what do you want to do with this? Or then they start recommending to record some sound. And for me, that's a way of meeting them uh, because if that's yeah, it gave me a, a reason to be there. Uh, it's a good, um, a good way of meeting them. And then they start telling me things. And uh, actually, before I went to the desert, I didn't know that people were, were uh, uh, watching or seeing lights during the night. But uh, actually, I start asking them, and uh, they start uh, yeah, telling me a lot of story of this place, uh, of different uh, kind of myths, of legends. And, uh, but then most of the people uh, start uh, talking to me about lights and the strange lights as I saw and everybody has an explanation about the lights they've seen. 
So that's all. Uh, after the few uh, a few talks, I start uh, asking more about lights, and I realize that everybody has seen lights, uh, very different lights, very different different explanation about the lights, and that's how I collect all the material. Uh, so basically, I, co I collect it yeah, in three different categories of material, which is all the talks and all the, the, the interview or the people talking. Uh, then all the sound of the place, which is uh, like the main uh, activity of during the shooting, it's recording sounds. And then uh, I've been working with these uh, images uh, during the nights and which was uh, working uh, in a way uh, with the subject or with the testimony of the people. And at the same time, I like the, the, the night because then at some point, I mean, when you make a sound piece and you uh, uh, screen it in a cinema, then it's a black screen. But when you put some lights uh, in the night, then the black screen is not a black screen. It's like the black of the night or it's a black of, the, of something else. And um, I like in this in this way the uh, the idea of uh, Orson Welles. We was we were saying that uh, when you are on radio, the screen is much bigger than in cinema because suddenly when the screen became black, it's not a black screen. You are in the middle of the desert in so in a way. Hmm. Um, well, in your film, it is suggested that all this mystery. Uh, is about to disappear. We can understand that contemporary life could put an end to certain traditions related to mystical and enigmatic practices that are that the people uh, talk about in your film. Um, how did you come to this conclusion? Well, I, I like all all those legend, legends in general. Uh, there, uh, most of the times, I have some reason to be. Uh, it's it's at some point to explain something that you couldn't explain or something that you couldn't accept. Uh, uh, I mean, if, you, if we uh, saw it in the Syrians, uh, in the mermaids, it's like to explain how uh, people could disappear in the sea. Or, uh, for example, uh, this could be one of the, well, the reasons. But uh, in general, all those legends they have a reason, but they have, uh, I like to find some contemporary. Uh, uh, context of this uh, legend of this myth and uh, I like to ask the people uh, what's the reason of these lights uh, to appear uh, not only that uh, I mean in this case uh, not only to tell me the legend not only to tell me the story but to try to explain me why it appears or not so sometimes of course I don't have any reasons re response but most of the time they try to analyze to analyze why they are seeing these uh, lights, and then in this uh, in in this place in this desert, they had a lot of different explanation. Uh, but one of those one of the explanation was yeah they were appearing a lot uh, because uh, there were no uh, electricity, there were no other lights before, and now that the lights of modernity are arriving. Um, well, the, the other lights are disappearing. And I like it in some way uh, because, uh, I mean, like when when they arrive, uh, uh, it gives you access to a lot of things, maybe to modernity, to electricity, but at the same time, probably some other things are disappearing. And, uh, and I think that's something that is happening or was happening in a lot of places. And so that's one of the explanations they gave me, and uh, I like it in a, in a way. Uh, uh, this relation between two different lights, the lights of the place, the light of the culture, the lights of that tradition, and the light coming from modernity. Uh, so that came out of the shooting. As the story of the lights, this possible explanation came during the shooting and uh, during uh, just talking with the people. Well, at what point uh, about um, Sasha's film? At what point in every group tour, the um, the following sentence is displayed on the screen. It says, "A, a different world calls for different images." Your film, Sasha, is strongly written in the present. It begins with the Brexit referendum and goes on assuming the pandemic. 
What was the starting point for every route tour and how did you develop the work during this strange year? So, yeah, thank you for the yeah, question. You. And it's really interesting for me to speak about the film. It's the first time I'm talking about it, actually. And unlike all the work that I've made in the past five years or so, that was really kind of research driven. Um, this film was made just in a matter of a few weeks from conception to finish. Uh, last September, just as it started to feel like the second wave was coming back with a with a vengeance, and all the material, all the visual material in the film, is things that I had on various old hard drives, either from entire projects that never quite manifested, or just things that I shot on various travels while making something else. Um, and there was some kind of spark that happened when I was thinking in general about the way that various impending disasters in the political sphere with Brexit, in the broader kind of ecological crisis, and in the kind of health catastrophe that we're all experiencing, that everything is coming to a head, but that all of them were one, very related to each other, and be not actually as um, sudden a rupture as they feel, but entirely in keeping with all the events that had been happening for the last years and decades and longer even. Um, and somehow I connected this thought to some of the images that I remembered from these various uh, bits of footage. And I tried to engage with them in that context and try and piece something together. And the more that I worked on it, the more things came along and the, um, the quote that you pulled out from the film about this idea of the new world and new images. I think in the summer for many of us, there was moments both from the ecological and the political perspective that felt as though something would have to change um, after the pandemic, but also in, in other realms and that this rupture provided an opportunity for something new to arise. And then of course that hasn't quite manifested in that way. Um, and many of the kind of visual aspects of the film try and address this issue about the, on the one hand, continuity between the past and the present, and then ultimately the future, but also the possibility of change. And so all the images in the way are recycled from the past in this kind of chirological time where their full meaning wasn't clear to me when initially shooting them, but that kind of came, um, be became uh, events developed. And on the other hand, um, the way that I play with the image um, and the mirroring that happens kind of tries to, on the one hand, introduce change to them, but on the other hand, um, produce this kind of doubling that shows the inevitable um, kind of mirror image of the of the past and the future, kind of playing on this idea of how history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. Mm -hmm. um, in recent years, you have been working on the concept of geological filmmaking. And uh, I would want to know uh, um, about this concept. So can you tell us about this concept? Um, yeah, so I recently finished a PhD project um, that involved filmmaking alongside research um, and, it, and its theme and title was geological filmmaking and its main kind of thrust was to develop modes of filmmaking that could somehow grapple with the main perceptual and representational challenges around the ecological crisis and particularly around various invisible aspects of it. Um, and as part of that project, I made a film about asbestos, dealing with the kind of invisible yet toxic and present thing. And then I made another film dealing with um, sinkholes in uh, the West Bank. Um, and in a way, geological filmmaking is both, both a practice and a concept that can be used to describe things, or it can be used as a methodology for approaching various non-human subject matter and this kind of core um, claim is that a certain type of filmmaking 
takes place at the intersection of three different types of agencies on the one hand of the non-human subject of the film itself on the other hand of the non-human technology that has its own it's evolution in the way. Um, and then finally of course the, the human author and ultimately audience and how it's about the staging of a material encounter between all these different actors that the film takes place um this new film every rupture in a way is a rupture from from that practice and was really made kind of immediately in response to circumstance but without filming which meant that there wasn't a material encounter with a space or a material let's say it was um yeah, it, it was more visually and conceptually driven uh, on the basis of existing footage. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have uh, no time for uh, more time for for any other question. But I want to um, thank you for participating in this conversation. And well, I'm very happy and grateful to have you here. And we will meet in Pamplona. I hope so. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.